Welcome to your College Bound Kid. Podcasts for parents and families everywhere. Whether you have kids that plan to attend college or you have current college students, you want them in and you want them to graduate. You want a quality education that makes you a more interesting person to be around. I am Mark Stucker and I'm a college coach. And I'm Anika Madden and I'm a parent. It is Thursday, May 2nd, and welcome to episode number 66. What artistic majors need to know. In this week's news, six terms to stop using in college admissions. And we're in chapter 66 of 171 Answers. And it's all about what visual and performing art majors need to know that is unique about their college application process. And this week's question is from a dad of multiple college kids who wants to know if he will be able to optimize college discounts, either through FAFSA or through the schools themselves. And Mark continues his interview with Chris Carlton, founder of StudyAbroadSmarter.com, and part two of The Value of Studying Abroad. Anika, have you noticed that after, in our intro, after I say, and you want a quality education, I always have like a different line after that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I'm running out of lines. <laughs> I'm running out of lines. <laughs> oh, I might have to start repeating. It's getting hard to come up with new ones. Uh, I don't think I'm going to remember all the other ones. I think you're safe. (laughs) Okay. Okay. I can cheat and go back then. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So, Anika, do you know how uh, you ever have something that's just like on your chest and you just got to like get it off? You usually like got to get it out and get it out of your mind or your your mouth to just get it off your chest. That ever Mm -hmm. happened to you? Mm Mm-hmm. So let me tell you how that happens to me. After we're done an episode. I always think of something that, why didn't I say that? Why did I say that? Because, you know, we're, we're both perfectionists, right? Mm. <laughs> and so I have a couple of things I just got to get off my chest that oh, I wish goodness. I said in the last <laughs> few episodes. That's where I'm going. <laughs> okay. So, like, remember, like, three episodes ago when we talked about, like, the writing prompts? Uh, we went over the seven prompts in the Common App. Mm-hmm. Remember that one? I do. So I just... I just want to say for you coalition people out there, we're not ignoring you because there's the common app, there's the coalition, and there's the institutional app. And, you know, there are now 150 schools taking the coalition. So I just Mm -hmm. want to say a couple things. One of them is that we're going to try to have an expert on, a dean, a director, senior level staff person to do a whole interview on the coalition. So don't be feel ignored out there. Because, Anika, I don't know if you know this, but if you're in, like, Florida, uh, University of Florida, University of Maryland, Washington, and some others, you have to do the coalition. Um, So I just want you to know we're not ignoring you. And also, one of the tips is to look at the coalition essay prompts and look at the Common App prompts, and you'll see there's a couple overlap. So that's a kind of a secret. Like, pick one of the prompts that works for both of them. So I had to get that off my chest. That was the writing prompt one. Now, college-specific essays. <laughs> when we talked about that, remember how we had the conversation about uh, they're not all essays. Some of them are like short answer. hmm So they're not all like 50 words, 150 words. Like one of them, Wake Forest has, just says, name your top 10. That's it. Mm-hmm. So that's an example yeah. of it's not an essay at all, right? Just name your top 10, whatever your top 10 is. So I just want to let people know that those literally don't even have to be like sentence form stuff. So that was that episode. And then the last one on recommendations. (laughs) Yes, this is the last one, I promise. (laughs) So we had a great conversation, episode 65, about recommendations. It was like our longest segment ever, like 30 minutes. But Anika, we spent 29 minutes talking about teacher and outside rec and one lonely minute on the counselor. (laughs) When I listen back. And so I just want to say that the way we're going to address that is we'll get a dean or a director or a senior level staff person. We'll do a whole interview just on the counselor rec. Very, very important. Is that okay? <laughs> now my guilt is assuaged. My conscience Are you having is... nightmares? Are you no, having nightmares? but my You're conscience is clear. I feel like I didn't shortchange our people. <laughs> Gotta uh, just be... trust me, you have not. That's okay. Five episodes. Okay. okay. All right. Transition and shout out time. We have to give a huge shout out to Kimberly Blass. And Kimberly is 
our print marketing person. So she's designed all of our postcards, a number of different things for us, our logo. And she's just really, really, really talented. She's professionally trained, a great designer, creative thinker, a range of skills, really pleasant to work with. And so patient when Anika and I are like, how about revision number seven? <laughs> you know, and she's just like, sure, Mark and Anika, no problem. So I just want to give a huge Thank shout you, out to Kimberly. Kim- yep. Shoot out to Kimberly. And if anybody wants to, is looking for someone to do their print marketing, marketing, just Kimberly, K-I-M-B-E-R-L-Y-B-L-A-S at hotmail.com. She is awesome. Oh, and one last thing before we transition. Thanks to, shout out to Leslie in California who caught a little air when we announced that webinar I got coming up for Revolution Prep that we announced. I think I gave the wrong address. <laughs> I think she went to sign up. <laughs> Mark. <laughs> yeah. <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> and gave the wrong address. So just it is <laughs> www.revolutionprep.com forward slash. And I said backslash forward slash webinars with an S forward slash. So I've got three webinars coming up and think people are going to like them if they're not tired of hearing me after a full hour (laughs) once a week (laughs) we can hit pause we can hit play we can hit pause we can hit play let's turn to college hot topics in the news mark our bff columnist mr brennan bernard has written this time with the task of identifying certain terms or college admis- college admission buzzwords that he feels should be left behind, um, mostly because of their overusage or their misconstrued intentions. So this t- this article, six terms to stop using in college admissions, is found in Forbes uh, pretty recently by Mr. Bernard. And so, first of all, he starts by bashing those that consider college admissions as a process. Ooh, Mark, I can, you know, I cannot wait to hear your feedback on all this stuff. And he goes on to quote a dean of admission who says, the experience of searching for and applying to college is a rite of passage moment. One that should be full of introspection, self-celebration, and the owning of one's voice and narrative with pride and confidence. Not a process. So, Mark, I know we, or at least I know I use a lot of these terms quite a bit. So, mm-hmm. um, I'm not going to stop saying them necessarily. Sorry, Brandon, but yep. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Brandon, me either. <laughs> so how, sh- how shall we do this? Shall I uh, rattle one off one by one and uh, let you grace us with your astute commentary? Well, I like that approach. I'll let our listeners decide if it's astute, but I like that approach. <laughs> but, <laughs> but let me start. Let me start by uh, uh, commenting on what the one you brought up already. Uh, This is something that uh, Rick Clark from Georgia Tech speaks about quite a bit, which is we make a mistake when we call it a process. And once again, uh, Matt Hyde, the dean of Lafayette, is bringing up this point. And I have to admit, this is not something that I've really thought of before, but they're actually right. Because this is their point they're making, Anika. When you call something a process... All you really think is get think about is getting through the process to get to the end destination, right? So if you like think, okay, I'm going to go through the process of making macaroni and cheese. You don't really think about anything you're doing. All you care is about I'm hungry. I want the mac and cheese, or I'm going to go through the process of getting to the airport. You don't think about anything but just getting to the airport. So the process that Matt Hyde, Dean of Lafayette, is making is by calling it a process. What you're doing is you're you're enforcing a mentality. And you're missing an opportunity to learn all of the life lessons that you can learn by going through. Um, I was going to say going through the process because I obviously use that word. (laughs) By going through the experience of applying. And there's lots of life lessons to be learned along the way. So I have to admit it isn't something that I've thought about. But I think that they both make a valid point. I say Matt Hyde because this is something that I just recently heard Rick Clark talking about. So both of the deans. So I think it's a good point. But let's I like your idea. Why don't you comment on the terms Brennan says? Uh, well, in fairness, it, it wasn't really Brennan. Oh, and just a little bit of background for our new listeners. Brennan and I worked together from 2001 to 2004 at the Westtown School. We were both trained by Susan Tree, who 
we have been getting lots of great feedback who was on episodes 58, 59, 60, 61. I think I got that right. Uh, Brennan appeared on episodes 39, 40, and 41, where we talked about 20 common mistakes parents make. So we've had him on our show before, and he's also he's a college counselor. He works with athletes. He works with the Harvard Graduate Institute. He works with, he's a firefighter. He does a lot. He's a jogger. <laughs> he's a director of college counseling, and he's a prolific writer. And so he writes for Huffington Post, Washington Post, Forbes, a lot of people. So um, I think with these, these different things, it's not just Brennan who feels they're overused. What Brennan did was he actually surveyed a number of deans and a number of college counselors, right? right. And he asked them, mm -hmm. uh, what terms do you think are misused, overused, that we probably would be better off dropping, clarifying, something like that? And that's where he came up with the list. But I like your idea, Nika. Let's go, uh, let's go through them. And you make your comments, and I'll make mine. Okay. All right. So term number one is fit. We say that quite mm -hmm. a bit. And what Brennan is saying, well, what the, the, the feedback that he received is that it can often be misunderstood as suggested that there will be one school that fits perfectly like a mm -hmm. glove. And it can be intimidating to students when this type of fit eludes them. I don't necessarily agree with that, but OK. So so here's what I'll say. Um, there's basically two approaches to college admissions, right? It really, really boils down to two. Either you're just going to strictly go with ranking slash prestige and just say one school is definitively better than a another school, no matter what, or you're going to focus on, no, different schools are better for different kids. And I think anybody who's listened to this podcast for 10 minutes knows that Nika and I believe in the concept of match or fit, right? That one school could be amazing for one student and it could be terrible for somebody else. So what that means right. is you are going, if anything, if I personally think there's not enough emphasis on fit or I call it match, match fit. I use those interchangeably. Uh, my company's called School Match for You. This is what I mean by match or fit. Now, some people don't use those terms interchangeably. Some people refer to match, meaning it's an academically, it's academically at your level and fit is everything else is right. I personally use them interchangeably. But um, here's where I will, uh, here's where I think there's a good point to be made, uh, though, Anika. Sometimes when you emphasize fit so much, so much, so much, so much, you have to balance it by saying to a family, there is no heaven on earth, no college is utopia. I tell people this all the time. All right. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. Your family's not perfect. Your current high school is not perfect. Don't be thinking your college is going to be perfect. So I don't have a problem with fit. I think fit and match need to be emphasized more, but with the caveat that you need to let people know, don't be thinking you're going to find heaven on earth. There you go. And I totally agree with that. Okay, so the next one is well-rounded. And this was actually pretty interesting, the point that he makes about being well-rounded, that term being used. He explains that colleges do not seek well-rounded people. We want angular individuals who create a well-rounded class. That was very interesting. What so, do you think about that? Um, I completely agree that's what colleges want. Uh, but what I don't agree is I don't see colleges using the term well-rounded too much. Not at all. because. They want, you know, I, what I see, mm. I see the public sometimes, you know, meaning Joe and Jane, right? Thinking that colleges mm -hmm. want the Renaissance man, the Renaissance lady, like the well-rounded connoisseur of everything, right? Sometimes I have to correct that, but I don't see colleges saying that at all. If anything, you know, Anika, how mm. admissions has its own world of little terminology and inside vernacular, you learn. Uh, yes, <laughs> you know, we do. So there's actually Goodness four gracious. terms that you'll find college admissions officers talk about amongst themselves or sometimes in presentations. And what they'll say is they may say we want the well-rounded class, but not necessarily the well-rounded applicant. Certainly some kids get in that or that way, but mostly the four terms that you'll sometimes hear, one of them you, you shared in the article, Anika which is the angular kid, right? And another term sometimes mm -hmm. you'll hear people use mm -hmm. is, this is more inside terminology, but admissions officers amongst themselves will say, oh, the applicant is spiked or pointy. He's pointy or she's pointy. Uh, or the fourth term is not well-rounded, but well-lopsided. 
And what all of these refer to is, at least for the highly selective schools, you, in general, you have a better chance of getting in if there's a couple things that you have pursued with great depth and passion and you stand out in them versus if you just come across as above average in a lot of things. So that makes you stand out Mm -hmm. more because now you're unique in the applicant pool. And we've talked about this. You want to be that one piece of the puzzle that nobody else is or very few people are, right? And so I personally don't see a lot of admissions people saying you need to be well-rounded. So I would disagree that term is overused by admissions people. So that's my view on that one. Okay. But but let's back up, though, because I didn't think he was saying just admissions folks. I thought he was just saying in the admissions world, because these are the words that we use when we're trying to get ready for this process. Look at me using that term and I'm going to continue to. Yeah. Um, what he's saying is that we the 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 audience, I mean, the you know, the students, the families, too, are using these things and they're misinterpreted it. And we're, and we're taking them and, and using them in the wrong ways. And I agree 100 percent with that. To- yeah. And I agree 100 okay. percent with that. So it's very common for applicants to think I, I need to be more well-rounded. I don't have enough community service. Mm-hmm. I need to be more well-rounded, you know, whatever, you know, fill in what area they don't think they're well-rounded in enough. And, and okay. yeah, gotcha. so, so, yep. Yep. Moving on. All right. So the next one, I slapped him a air high five on this one. And this is the word passion. <laughs> I like that <laughs> air I'm high sorry. five. How do you do an air? What do you do? You literally slap the air. What's an air high five? I did it. I did it. I mean, Let me tell you how I did it. Oh. Oh. <laughs> So let me read what he says. Passion is a word that makes high school students cringe. It makes me cringe, too, because if I feel like I don't have passion, I'm like, oh, crap. Mm-hmm. So when they hear college admission offices talk about finding or demonstrating passion, they are often paralyzed by the perception that they must know what they will be doing for the rest of their lives. Yeah. And I totally agree with that. I feel mm-hmm. like, yes, I do feel like that term passion needs to go swept, be swept under a rug somewhere. I'm down with you on that one, friend. So I have mixed feelings. Because I agree with everything you said, and I agree with Rachel Simmons from the Hockaday School, who's who you quoted when she said that. The word passion can put pressure on people, like, oh my goodness, you know, I'm not sure what I want to do in life. It sounds like I need to know. And and she recommends we talk more about purpose than passion. But the problem, here's the, here's a challenge with this. Basically, what admissions officers are saying is, we want to know what excites you. We want to know what enlivens you. We want to know what you know, electrifies you, what stirs you up, what you're enthusiastic about, okay? That's what we want to know, whether it's your extracurriculars or your academics. The problem is you want to be able to communicate that with brevity in a succinct way. And that's why the word passion is kind of a shorthand. Like, do you want to say that every single time you want to say that? Like, that's too long to say. We want to know what you're (laughs) – figure out how do you say that, like, in shorthand. (laughs) We want to like, but, you but, can't just say Martin, animates, let, animates, elevates, exhilarates. Like, what are you talking about? So that's kind yeah, of why I understand I guess I that. Know, well, and I get it, but I do know several kids, right. several, meaning more than three. Yeah. That don't necessarily connect with anything like that. Mm-hmm. And that's not saying that something's wrong with them, but I've seen, and, and I think we've talked about, oh, you remember when we did our like first, first, first podcast, we talked about this kid who was at this event that I went to with mm-hmm. Jalen mm-hmm. and his his dad, you know, they had them split up in categories. Mm-hmm. And they're like, okay, if you identify with this, this or this, go into that group. Mm-hmm. And that kid was sitting there so distraught and confused because he could not connect with anything. And he's not the only child I've seen like that. So that's where I, that's, that's where my uh, air high five is coming from because I get the number of kids who don't, or who are not able to connect with whatever it is that they're excited about. Like, that's a reality. That's a thing. It is. And but I feel let, like we need to acknowledge that. We do. But here, here's what I, I'm going to try to make a fine little nuanced difference and see if I can communicate this effectively or if it falls flat. I know I know one thing. You'll, you'll come clean with me. I don't have to worry about that. We would like to thank every listener who has financially supported our show. We want to make sure that our friends of the show know that you absolutely can make a one-time gift or you can sign up for one of our monthly giving levels. Recently, we received a lovely letter from a college counselor who made a gift and said she wants to support the show quarterly, and that is also okay. 
And if you make a one-time gift or a quarterly gift, you may still be entitled to the same benefits we extend to our monthly donors. That's right. For a gift of $60 or more within the first 12 months, you'll get all the benefits we provide in our sustainer plan. And a gift of $120 or more in the first 12 months, and you'll get all the benefits we offer in our expander plan. So to support the show, all you have to do is go to yourcollegeboundkid.com and click the donate button. Either click the monthly gift tab or the one-time gift tab. And be sure to visit our frequently asked question page, which is also located at yourcollegeboundkid.com for more details. This is also where you can learn about the sustainer plan and the enhancer plan. Your financial support helps us defray the sizable expenses that it takes to deliver all of this great content that is aimed to empower you and your family's college admissions journey. Different people have different abilities to give, but whatever you can contribute will be greatly appreciated and it will allow us to remain commercial free. So thank you in advance. Thank you. Like I was doing a session with the mom in Philadelphia yesterday, right? And so she's like, my son doesn't know what he wants to do. Is it okay to be undecided? This is kind of her question she asked, which we could take that on. That would have been a good question for our question from a listener. But anyway, so this is the thing that I'll say. If you come across like you're multi-interested, that's okay. I'm multi-interested in a lot of different things, and I'm not sure which one necessarily the most. I'm hoping college, you know, I can... For certain schools, it's okay. Like some schools, you have to pick a major ahead of time and all that. It's a little tougher. But what's hard is if you come across like just blah, like nothing animates me. Nothing really, I don't, there's no type of reading I want to do. There's no activities that appeal to me. You got to understand like college college admissions is a, is about projecting what your impact will be on the college campus. And so if I'm reading your file and I can't figure out anywhere at all where I see that anything at all you love or you're interested in, that may be where you're at. But I'm just going to tell you, that's going to be extremely hard for me to get excited about advocating for you versus other people that have areas where I can see they can plug in. It can be a million things. It could be I just love chess and I can't, you know, I just get so excited to Wake up at six in the morning and go to go to the chess club meeting. It can be a million things. It can be robotics. It can be a million. No, I'm, that was probably a bad example. You can tell I just that was terrible. Shot, uh, see, I told you you'd come straight with me. I didn't have to worry about that. That was oh terrible. Six a.m. chess meeting. That stunk the house out. They just say, "Goodness." Anyway, um, I don't know. Is that making any sense? No, it does. And I get it. But I just want I, I feel for those kids who are not there. And I know they I know. exist. I know. And I and, feel for them. Too. And I know I know it's a part of the game. I know. But I'm just saying for those parents who have those children, now's the time to talk about it. And to like you said, it could be anything. It could be it could be anything. And, and probably nine times out of 10, there is something there. But the kid just hasn't learned how to articulate it or to. To, right. to think about it in that way, I don't know. So I guess that's, that's the big takeaway for me on that. And, or for but, you on that. but there are some other people that I've worked with that they're just nothing. Like the parents will say, like, I just don't know what what's going to get this kid excited. Like, I just don't know. Like, I've tried mm-hmm. this camp and that camp and this and that. And nothing seems to ever get the Like, those kids exist, too. And right. I'm just going to say, particularly at a selective college, that's going to be tough. That's going to be tough. And so when yeah. member yeah. colleges are telling you what they want, you know, and, and if that's not what you yeah. offer, then there's still a place for you. But you might need to go down a little level of when it comes to selectivity tier. So what about let me ask you this, Mark. So what about those schools that are not so highly selective, but they still but you're still filling out the same application, right? You're still filling out the common yeah. app or whatever it is where you're trying to convey your interest. So somebody's reading this mm-hmm. stuff, if, even if it's not at Princeton yet, whatever all these, you know, high, in schools are. And there's some, like you right. said before, there's some public institutions that are getting a little more holistic in their approach. So what is it that, um, I guess how, I don't know. I actually almost lost my train of thought. Mark, let's edit that out. Well, but, I, I, mean, I, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, it could go back to the fact that the acceptance rate nationally is two thirds, two out of three kids are getting in college. Mm-hmm. Okay. 80% of colleges accept more than half their applicants. Okay. So those schools is fine. Just be, you know, for those schools, just be, just, you know, just be like a B student or sometimes even a, a, a BC student or CB student and just be like a relatively good kid and you're fine. So it's not mm-hmm. like there's not a college out there for you, right. but uh, you know, 
a lot of times our listeners are listening for tips on how to get in some more selective schools. And I'm just saying that if there's nothing that excites you academically or extracurricularly, it's going to be tough sledding if it's a selective school. That doesn't mean yeah. you can't have a great life because you might <laughs> find your thing 25, you know? Right, right. Okay, we're too passionate about this term passion. So let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next. So the, so the next one is diversity. And what it says here is that diversity has become a catch-all term in our language that has perhaps lost its meaning. How are you feeling about that? Yeah, I agree with this. And by the way, they quote Maria Bigham in here. She runs a fantastic Facebook group for people that are really concerned about social justice in the college admissions. And so they quote her here, and uh, she's great. And she says, I want our profession to seek equity and justice for marginalized communities that have often been kept the way from post-secondary education. So basically what she's saying is diversity is just a buzzword. It's become so diluted and so watered down that it doesn't even mean anything anymore. Everybody says they're diverse <laughs> and it doesn't even mean anything. And I agree with her. So yeah. I, I probably I probably identify with this one as much as any of them as yeah. being like totally on, totally on point. I concur. All right. The next one and the last one actually I have, which is, is that five or six? Is it six terms? Yeah. I think- so I got to say something. No, 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 no. I'm glad you said this. Cause I was about to text Brennan because, you know, Brennan's my guy. <laughs> Brendan, can you count? <laughs> Let me tell you why. Because the article oh, says oh, yeah, six fine. things, right? <laughs> yes. And no, I, it had me like I was losing my mind. I'm going back over and over and over trying to count. One, two, three, four, five. I must have done it 20 times. And I'm not kidding. <laughs> so what I know what that was, Brendan put six and it's five. But the, here's the only thing that I can think. At the oh, very goodness. end, he listed a bunch of honorable mentions and everything. So maybe all those things... Big better combined make up number six, but I'm okay, just being the final extra one. gracious, Brennan. Yes, let's do number five, Brennan. We're all human, Brennan, by the way. Mark. Yes, thank you, Brennan. <laughs> Brennan, forgive me. Forgive me, Brennan. This last term, undermatching. I actually never heard of mm-hmm. undermatching, but okay. Tell us about what undermatching is. Um, so undermatching is a very common term college counselors use. And what it has to do with Anika is, let's say you're uh, extremely strong, well, not you, but let's say, you know, one of your kids is exceptionally, well, let's just take Jalen. He was like a 3.9 student at a very rigorous boarding school, right? And let's say he ended up going to a college that kind of took like 3.2 students or 2.9 or 3.4 students. That's called undermatching, meaning Um. he didn't go to a college that was as selective as what his credentials warranted. Oh. So this is an extremely common term that's used in college admissions. Okay. Uh, but I thought Jody Glassman from FIU, I thought that, um, and I don't know Jody, so uh, I, this is a dumb question. I'm embarrassed to ask you this. Jody is normally a lady's name, but can't that be a guy too? Yes, it can. That's what I thought. Woo, woo. So glad. <laughs> I'm about to embarrass myself on the but air. But this is a female so, here, right? Oh, does it say that? I don't know. Does oh, it say no, she? I don't oh, know. Yep. I don't yeah. It does. No, no, no. It does. Nope. I'm looking at it. It says she okay. says. Okay. Yep. It says she says. Okay. Sorry, Jody. Um, didn't know. So so Jody makes up some real uh Jody Jody, I think, has a really good point in terms of, of what she says here. And she says, often when someone tells a student they're undermatching, it's based only on one characteristic, academic achievement. And the reason why this is important is what I teach in the process I use with students is it's an academic match, it's a social match, it's a financial match, and it's an emotional match. It should be all four. Hmm. And a lot of times, the student happiness piece is oftentimes dictated by whether or not it's a social match. And so basically what Jody's saying is like, why are we so narrowly defining matching exclusively on the academic piece and not looking at social, financial, and emotional? I think that's a good point. Hmm. But we don't do that. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, you never heard of the term, so you're exempt. <laughs> it's a, but I don't blame you. But, but we honestly, still don't under, do that. <laughs> but honestly, un, honestly, under matching is not the kind of thing like the parents talk about. It's more of a college counseling thing. You know, there are college counselors like, that student undermatched or overmatched even is the opposite of overmatching is like if a student, you know, was like a three, four student, but they go to a school that's taking like three, nine, five kids that happens, you know, for different reasons. So mm, okay. listen, because we 
Um, he only gave us five, and I feel robbed. Um, this is what it says at the end. <laughs> The end. No, I'm going to reach out to Brennan. Brennan, count. So listen, I'm going to reach. So this is what it says. Did not say At robbed. The, <laughs> robbed of value. No, this is a great conclusion. The article. Listen, a few honorable mentions from deans and counselors were words like fair, we better, perfection, safety, school, college placement, holistic, um, and and those are some of the other words. And one thing I want to say is I concur so much with the word holistic. And in the webinar I'm doing on May 8th for Revolution Prep, I am going to talk about that a lot because holistic is one of those. If if I was surveyed for this, if I was one of the counselors and I had to pick my words, Anika, I absolutely mm -hmm. would have picked holistic for sure. Um, the reason is everybody wants to claim that they're holistic because the opposite holistic is that we just make decisions based on the numbers and they want it. Then nobody wants to say, oh, yeah, you're just a number. So then they mm -hmm. claim they're holistic, and so many people really are really not, and they're not truly holistic, and that kind of is one of my little pet peeves. And one other one I would have thrown in there is full demonstrated need. Everybody says they meet full demonstrated, not everybody, but a lot of people say we meet full demonstrated need, and they're stretching the definition. So those are my mm -hmm. thoughts. What do you think? I think Brandon did a good job with those five points. He sure <laughs> he did. slack. I but know. But yeah, no, that was great. And again, I'm not saying I'm going to stop using all of these, but there are a couple. There are some good nuggets in there. So I there really that. are. There really are. Brennan, I have a sense of humor. Don't be mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> Busted on you for six, not five, not six. Now it's time for our step-by-step -step walkthrough of the college admissions process. All right. So. In our 66th episode, we are discussing the 66th chapter of a book I wrote called 171 Answers to the Most Asked College Admissions Question. And the question of this chapter is this, what do visual and performing arts majors need to know about how their college application process is unique? Aniko, what were your thoughts? You read the chapter? I did read the chapter and your 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 beginning, your opening statements on all of these are always so powerful because this one starts by saying, Hey, y'all should be starting in ninth grade, and that's for sure. I was like, dang. <laughs> no, thank so you, that Anika. Was the, that was the first, like, whoa, okay, y'all need to be starting a little <laughs> bit earlier than everybody else. Yeah. And, athletes, I athletes mean, athletes and art majors are the one time when I say, like, you know, normally I like people to start the college process in spring of tenth. But for athletes and artists, I say ninth grade. But go ahead. Yeah. Well, I mean, but you Explain list why. several several good reasons why. I mean, if you want me to to, to yep. name a few, I'll of go these. through them. Yeah, name and a few of them. So, and and let me just say, all of these are interesting to me because I got I have STEM babies. Like, I, none of my kids want right. to be artistic. Right. Even I try to force them. Right. Right. They're just not. So, the <laughs> first one that I that I noted here is that you're you're advising them to attend the closest NACAC arts fair. Can you describe what that NACAC is? Is that the same as a Counseling something, 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 something. Yeah. So NACAC is an acronym, National Association of College Admissions Counselors. It's a professional organization, you know, for college counselors and admissions professionals. And when I say I went to the SACAC fair, I talk about that's their regional fair. So there's all these, you know, regional gatherings. But it's also an organization that puts on national college fairs and it puts mm -hmm. on arts fairs as well. So these are the big, huge fairs that come to like the 20 largest cities in the country. And they're huge okay. fairs. And so, yeah, so okay. the addition to having the general college fair, which comes to Atlanta every year, you know, all the big cities, uh, they put on arts fair. So that's what that is. Okay. And let me just, let me summarize a few of these other ones that I noted. Because sure. I feel like yeah, the, the strong message that I took from this chapter is that these artistic majors need to really be realistic with themselves. They need to be honest with themselves. Mm -hmm. And the, the mm -hmm. different ways you tell them to do that is to attend. There's this other... Um, well, first of all, you tell them to trust the, their the feedback or the constructive feedback that they're getting from their actual art teachers, like their professors or teachers, I guess, in high school. Um, to ask your parents early on if they're being supportive of your what you're trying to do. But, and I, I mean, mm -hmm. and to your point, it's all about the financial because you don't want to find out when you're trying to enroll in college that they're not going to give you any money because they don't support. Well, agency. I wouldn't just say it's all about the far financial. I would say that. There are going to be some parents, like if you spend two, three years working on your art portfolio and everything, and you turn around and say, I want to go to Art Institute, there'll be some parents that are saying, and who's paying for it? It's not me. 
because some parents <laughs> right. will say, I'm not, I'm not funding a starving artist. So that's what right. I meant by that. You know? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So that, and then the other one was about attending the national portfolio day, which I thought was extremely interesting. Um, and you, and you're advising them to attend the national portfolio day as a sophomore and a junior. And this is where you can go to this massive gathering and you'll get honest feedback on your artistic portfolio. So it's uh, so again, it, though, I, I say those because those are the ones where you're saying, hey, you really got to, to be real with yourself, get the get the honest feedback, deal with it and be prepared if your parents are not going to pay for this. Yeah. And, and there are some national auditions. All right. In places like Chicago, New York and L.A. where you can perform for multiple schools in the same trip. Because the key thing with artistic admissions is that you're going to have either an audition, right? Mm -hmm. Most of the time, you're going to have an audition or you're going to have a portfolio. Now, we do need to just add a little bit of clarity, okay? Because when you're talking um, about um, being an art major, you could be talking about different things. So you may right. remember, do you remember, Nico, I talked about sort of the three different versions of how you can pursue art as a major? Um, I don't. I remember you talking about the three different types of schools that they should visit. Yes. Yeah, yeah maybe that's how I should explain mind. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'm sorry, I didn't explain that well. Yeah, so the three different types of schools, for example, an art institute, or you mm -hmm. have a university with a college of art, or you could have a university with a strong arts department, right? And so mm -hmm. those are different. And so I encourage people to visit all three and sort of figure out which one is for you. Because the Art Institute is going to be the one that's the most focused on the arts versus a university with a college of arts like in between. And then a strong arts department is, uh, you know, it's a regular university, but it has a strong arts department. And by the way, we did talk about um, So You Want to Be a Theater Major on episode 20. We had an interview on that with an expert. Carol Concord from George Washington. And we actually had Carol back again, episode 48, So You Want to Be a Music Major. So we kind of focused a little bit there on theater and music. Uh, this is the first time we've kind of talked about visual arts. But I know we are going to need to bring an expert in just to have an interview specifically about this. Because this chapter, I'm kind of combining mm -hmm. performing arts and visual. Because stuff we're talking about right. really... Because if we're talking about actors, filmmakers, singers, musicians, dancers, visual artists, designers, all of that falls under art as well as as well as you know visual arts, right? And so that's why mm -hmm. some of them it's a portfolio, and some of them it it's an audition. And then there's so many mm -hmm. different things. So one of the things I do you remember when I said read the website, read the website, read the website, and he can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That yeah. to me is one of the main points I made because you need to look and figure out like some schools. For example, you got to do a portfolio, right? Or you got to do an audition live right in front of them. Other other cases, you can send a video in. Okay. And some of them have like a pre-screening at first. And if you pass the pre-screening, then you're invited to come perform. So they all are a little different. And that's why the website mm -hmm. will lay, lay it out. But yeah, you definitely want to start in, in ninth grade for this process uh, because it's complicated. And you want to be able to get a good read by 10th so you can kind of make sure you're going the right direction. It's just like athletic re athletics. Yeah. So do you do you work with a lot of kids and and that are interested in the arts and are they coming to you too late? Um, I don't work with as many artistically um interested kids as I do athletes. I have a lot oh, more okay. students that want to do division one, division two, II, division three, NAIA, all of that. I certainly like right now I'm working with maybe three or four uh students that are pursuing the arts. Different arts too. Yeah. Now and and but that depends. Like now, if we broaden it out and include like dance and film, then it maybe it's more like eight or ten that I'm working with, and that and I'm including mm. both my students in Kip as well as private. Right, the combination of both. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, what, what do, do you think? say to the junior? What what do you what do you say to the parent of the junior who's listening to this right now, and they may not have done all these things? Yeah, that's a great question, really? Anika, because like, like, let's face it, most of our listeners, based on the emails we get, are parents of 10th, 11th, and 12th, and then college counselors. There's a, most people that right. email us. So uh, you got you just have, you're going to have to accelerate the evaluation, right? You got it because mm -hmm. it's just like, that's one of the biggest things with athletics. So you've got to be able to figure out how good are you and where you're a competitive applicant. Because like, do you remember me talking about, that's one of the reasons why I said, trust your 
your high school teachers. They've seen a lot of, or sometimes you're working with private people outside of school. You need to trust them and not be offended because you might think you're Picasso, but they've seen a lot more talent than you. <laughs> and I would say go mm-hmm. as if you can get to one get to one of it depend now. It's a little different. Are we talking about performing? Are we talking about visual? You know, but get to one of these places where you're evaluated and get and ask always ask for honest feedback. You've got to get that evaluation mm-hmm. down early and you've got to figure out your parents are on board with this. That's the quick most important thing to do right away because Every single thing you do is going to flow out of what level can you perform at and um, is there support from your family at you pursuing this? Mm-hmm. What do you think? Well, I love the arts. I love, love, love the arts. So I wish you all the best of all. Wait a minute now. You say you love the arts, but when, it, when, when Janae was talking about being I a veterinarian, you were like, that's not the arts, but you're like, what no, about no, no, STEM? No. What is, about STEM? Is... <laughs> No, no, no. I love the arts as in extracurricular for me right now. You know what? I I didn't say for my kids. I just thought about something, Anika. (laughs) Are you comfortable telling our listeners where where you worked at for a long time when you were in Atlanta? Because you do love the arts. Uh, Why don't you tell our listeners this? Where I developed my love for the arts. Yes, I worked at the High Museum uh, of Atlanta, High Museum of Art, Atlanta, for many, 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 many a years. Don't make yourself sound that old. Uh, well, it's part of the. <laughs> yeah, well, it is what it is, and um, it's part of the Woodruff Art Center. Mm-hmm. And for people that know Atlanta and know the High, they know it's you know the Symphony, you got the Lions Theater, and all that good stuff over there. So the arts matter big time. So parents, if, if you're thinking about not supporting your kids in the arts, you better rethink yourself because that's not right. Because we need it. <laughs> but yeah, so. There you go. Yeah, I, I'm gonna well. pull. I'm gonna pull Anika. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> and there it is. <laughs> it's time for a question from one of our listeners. All right. Question this week is coming from Mr. John from Massachusetts. And John writes, hi, Mark and Anika. My name is John, and I live in Massachusetts. I discovered your podcast a couple of weeks ago, and I want to let you know it's absolutely fantastic. Thank you, John. It's so These sweet. listeners have been flattering us so, lately. You know that? <laughs> these writers, these question askers. No, we got we to gotta deflate these heads, Mark. <laughs> All right. So he says, I have three kids in college at the same time, starting fall of 2020 for two years. Whew. One is currently a freshman in college. The other two are currently high school juniors. Can you please explain how can how I can best optimize multi-student discounts? Quote, discounts. Do colleges take this into account or is it only FAFSA that does? If so, how can I tell whether through research or applying which colleges will likely provide best discounted packages? All right. So I, I'm guessing that he's saying, Mark, that he's going to put them all in the same school and that's where he's going to discount from? No, that's not how oh, I no. took it. I took it as... Might have, I took it based, maybe meant that, but I took it as will colleges look at the fact that I have multiple kids in college and give me a multi-student discount, which is something a lot of private schools do, private high schools, middle schools, you know, the multi-school, multi-student discount. So there's good news Mm -hmm. and there's bad news. I'll start with the bad news. The bad news is I don't know of any colleges that give multi-student discount. Now, there's 2,600 four-year accredited schools out there. Even more, if we count on credit, but just the credit at 2600 So I don't know every single school and their policy. But a multi-student discount is extremely rare. And the reason for that is, there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one is, even like when we had it, like I was part of a school that had it for a while and we took it away when I was doing K-12 work. Because you looked at yourself, what, what colleges want to do is they want the money to go to who needs it the most. And you can have a multi-student situation with someone that makes seven figures. And you're like, money is finite. Money is precious. Like there's only a certain pot of money. So then you're asking yourself, why should we give extra money to this person even that makes seven figures or high six figures just because they have two kids when this family over here that makes $60,000 is struggling like heck. So most schools would rather do a complex need analysis and make your aid award be more a reflection of your actual need, not the fact that you have multiple students. So that's the first thing. 
The second thing, and this is probably even more important, is the FAFSA formula is incredibly generous to multi-students. So basically, just to put it real simply, if a family has an expected family contribution of, let, I'll just throw a number out, $40,000, and then they have two kids in college simultaneously, they that expected family contribution, remember, that's done on a student-by-student basis, not a family basis. That goes to 20000 for each of the two kids. So, so I think hmm. two times I've had a privilege of working with triplets. I'm working with triplets now, and I work with triplets back in – yeah, oh I'm working with goodness. triplets now, only 11th grade, and I work with triplets in 2010. And I was like, you know, I, you know what? I'm like, this is where you get the reward for all that hard work because, you know, <laughs> if it was one student, your EFC would be 30, and it's three, so it's 10 for each of them. So the FAFSA formula is extraordinarily generous that way. Um, the CSS formula is not quite as generous. It's still generous, but it's like you pay 60%, not 50% for both students. So still, it's like a 40% off discount, not a two. Okay. So, so here's the key, though. This is really important, and this I want people to hear, and I, I really want to make sure that um, everybody listening um, – comes away with an understanding of this, and especially John and Mass, who asked the question. So, just because a school, just because you have a lower expected family contribution, that does not mean that a college is going to give you the money that your expected family contribution mm. says that you are yes. eligible for. Yes. This is very, very, yes, very important. Yes, yes. So, Anika, of the 2,600 accredited four-year colleges, take a guess what percentage are committed to meeting full demonstrated need, meaning basically is their formula, not yours, by the way. That's another point, right? Just because of just because you have an EFC of 10,000, that's not what you think you can pay. That's what the formula says you can pay. So most of the time when most of the time people right. can't even understand in the world how they came up with that EFC because they feel they feel it's unreasonable. But having said that, what do you think of the 2,600 schools? How many would, in effect, guarantee to meet a full full demonstrated need? 3%. Oh, have you been – you remember that. That was in that Game Changer video <laughs> series I had back in 2014. Huh? You got it right on. <laughs> <laughs> I must be, like, uh, sadistic or pessimistic. Why do I want you to be wrong when you guess? When you guess <laughs> hey, and you I guess was, right. You and just I'm took the words out of my mouth. You guess right. I'm disappointed <laughs> over here. What does that say about me? You just took all those words right what out of my mouth. What were you going to say? I sound disappointed. Why do you? <laughs> like, why are you upset? Because I guess, like, I <laughs> oh, got boy. it. Oh, boy. You're not starting to read my mind. That's just getting scary. It's getting scary. But no. So... Well, well, but you know why I know. Because Jalen went to one of the very few, two yeah. that does it. Yeah, well, that so was part of our list building. That's why when we were... I'm a little bit in the loop. Yeah, right? you're, you mean Jayla went to one of the very few that does it without loans. So when a school says it meets full demonstrated need, that doesn't mean that they're not throwing in a $5,500 loan, maybe $2,500 a work study, and maybe a summer job component built okay. in. So they still could be asking to come up with $10,000 of self-help. But, so mm -hmm. the key is, the FAFSA formula builds it in. But what you need to do is be a strong enough applicant to go to one of the schools that meets full demonstrated need, or it doesn't really matter that your EFC got sliced in half or in third with the three kids, right? It doesn't matter right. because those colleges that don't have as much money, they will ask you what they can afford to pay you to still pay their faculty and pay, you know, for all their, you know, facilities and you know all the all the all the expenses that they have to run the school, right? Mm -hmm. They will charge you what they need you to pay in order to keep keep afloat. You need to go to a college that will charge right. you what you can afford to pay. So you need to know what that list is. Right. And what right. I'll do, John, is I'll send you that list by email because you sent in a great question. I'll shoot it to you. And if anybody else wants that list, just uh, send an email to uh, questions at yourcollegeboundkid dot com, and I'll shoot you the list of schools that meet full demonstrated need. Awesome. You rock, Mark. Sometimes. <laughs> okay, friends. If you missed part one of my interview with Chris Carlton, he is passionate about study abroad. I encourage you to go back and listen. And in part two, Chris shares what he has learned from 
study abroad from all of the bloggers, the advisors, and all the interviews that he's done. And Chris also addresses the concern about cost. And he's got encouraging news for us. I share my experience with my own kids and their experience going abroad. And then Chris shares different options for students when it comes to studying abroad, when it comes to internships, exchanges, and volunteer opportunities, and third-party programs. And finally, Chris talks about homestays. So listen and enjoy. And now, this week's interview with a special guest. I say that 10, 10, 10%, only 10% of students study abroad. And I interview the 10 and the audience is the 90 that are thinking about it or that aren't going to go and trying to push them and get that number higher than 10%. Great, great. So you've got a resource about study abroad on studyabroadsmarter.com. And then you've got the podcast, of course, where you interview lots of students and advisors. So, so what are some things that you've learned about study abroad from all the interviews you've done, either with students or advisors? I've probably learned, and again, so it speaks to the audience, which is the 90% that are on the bubble about it or not even thinking about it, is that there's, like college, right? Mm -hmm. And you're big on this. Mm -hmm. There's an option for everyone. Mm -hmm. I, so if, if you think, like, there's no way I can go, and the, the number one reason people don't go is cost, and mm -hmm. they'll say, well, I'm already – X amount in debt, how, like, why is it worth it to tack on even more? It's expensive. And two, there's two answers to that. First of all, just go somewhere. Mm -hmm. And just for the inter international experience, what I say is go, do, do a month in Canada, mm -hmm. right? Just, just, get, just put it on your resume and get out. And it is experience. So just do that. And second mm -hmm. of all, as far as the cost goes, there are numbers that prove this, that Students that study abroad make more in their career, and you'll be able to get a job easier. So you can make the argument that it's exponentially more expensive not to study abroad. Yeah, and and um, I'm gonna just just share my own story here, which which I did also on on your podcast. But yeah. uh, you know, my daughter Karis, uh, she went abroad six times in high school. Six times she went to Honduras four times. And she went to Kenya twice, and you know it was it was it was a financial commitment, uh, but it was just so transformative in her whole worldview. And it's you know it's interesting you talk to her, she you know she'll say oh that's so American or North American. It's just the 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 way she sees the world is completely different. Her understanding of the world socially, politically. Um, always the, the network that she's built. And in her case, it, it has actually translated in, into a lot of what she's doing now. And then in college, she, she went to Peru uh, for four and a half, uh, well, four and a half months, one full semester, Chile, Bolivia, uh, once again. Um, and it was some of the best money that I know that we've ever spent. Um, so I, to me, it's, yeah. to me, it's, you know, there's certain things that you kind of just find money for because they're that important, right? So you're going to have food in your in your body. Um, if you've got a car and it breaks down, you're going to get it fixed if any way, shape, or form possible. You're going to pay your electric bills and your utility bills because they're just that important. Uh, you may forgo um, an international vacation or maybe even a domestic vacation. Or maybe you'll drive instead of fly. You'll make certain sacrifices, but some things – they're just essential, and I think study abroad needs to be in that bucket. And it's it, it's a and it's about priorities. And and um, actually, let's get into costs a little bit more because one of the things you're aware of are some study abroad scholarship money that's out there. So why don't you talk about that a little, Chris? Yeah. So ninety percent of the students that I inter that I've interviewed on the show so far receive have received some kind of scholarship or grant. And honestly, I, I'm racking my brain, but I think the 10% that don't, I'm playing with those two numbers, but it, I, it's because they don't even apply. So there are, you're going to get something. So I, I try to simplify it and say they're paying you to travel. Um, second, as far as the cost goes and going back to the different options, there are there's so many different ways, depending on which school you're at. Like I've heard instances where people save money 
on a semester for studying abroad because they either a get so much many scholarships and grants i forget which interview it's a recent one i forget who it was but someone said they did the, their entire trip for three hundred dollars because like literally like they did the math boiling it down and that's how many scholarships they get but the second thing i was going to say as far as ways to save money if you're an out-of-state student or at a private school for example that's in a lot of instances it'll be cheaper for you per semester to study abroad, given the tuition costs. That's fantastic. I, I really don't think that our listeners knew, and I didn't know that 90%, um, now that 90% of people that get money, is that a, is that your anecdotal take from the people that have come to your show, or have you seen statistics no, no, on no, that? No, 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 it's just ironic. Yeah, yeah I was going to, no, it's, it's from like who I've interviewed, like the students that I've, that I've had on the show. And honestly, it's probably even higher than that. And like I said, the ones that don't are like, no, I just didn't do it or it wasn't like an option for them to do it. I don't know. But most people do. So and it's a thing, too, where you think scholarships and this is going into your world, Mark, and I'm sorry if I interjected mm-hmm. there. But no, 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 no. I feel like I didn't apply to uh, coming out of high school. I don't think I applied to any scholarships because I just thought like, well, I don't have a 4.0 GPA. I'm not this. I'm not that. So many other students will get that. And I, going back, I wish I would have, but it kind of acts as a funnel. Like the, the United States government in your school and so many people are trying to increase the, the amount of students that are studying abroad. And so there's definitely resources there for you. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. Now, one of the things you said in your own experience is that your experience was uh, somewhat non-traditional right. um, compared to other experiences, partly because you went in your senior year. I know most of uh, Karis and her friends, they went fall semester of junior year. Uh, I know one of her Spanish professors was urging her to go in the sophomore year. She said she'd be so much more fluent if she went over there then. But let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. The recommended resource for episode 66 is the official SAT app that sends you a word a day. Now, students and parents often ask me, when should I, or in the case of parents, when should my child start preparing for the SAT or the ACT? I tell them, you prepare your whole life by reading a wide range of well-written nonfiction and looking up the words you don't know. I tell them, you prepare your whole life by doing lots of math puzzles, games, quizzes, in a possible taking advanced math coursework. Then I tell students and parents, if you've had Algebra 2, the formal part of your prep should start at the end of 10th grade so you can take advantage of the summer between 10th and 11th. But there is one exception when I'm comfortable with the students starting before then, in 9th or, in rare cases, the summer between 8th and 9th. And these cases are, first of all, when the student, not the parent, the student, not the parent, really does want to start early. And then secondly, when they're willing to start very slowly by using the SAT Word of the Day feature. Now you can download this app from the Apple Store or Google Play for Android, and Anik and I will put the link for this app in the show notes. But what I like about the app is that it's just one question a day, but that's over 500 questions if you start at the start of 10th, or 1,000 questions if you start even earlier. And what I really like is you are making practice part of your regular routine. Any place, any time, you answer question of the day on the daily practice for the new SAT app and you get immediate feedback. This free app makes it easy. You just answer an exclusive official reading, writing, language, or math question, and you can even ask for a hint if you're stuck. And then you read the answer explanations and you learn from your mistakes. Now, the ACT Online Prep also has a great app, but I chose not to emphasize it here because it's not that I'm biased toward the SAT over the ACT, but the ACT app wants 40 bucks where the SAT app is free. We will now return to my interview with Chris Carlton on the value of study abroad. Talk to me about the, the different range of experiences that you see, like the different types, the different options for study abroad. All right. So first of all is the length. Um, I've, the, the shortest, I think there's a guy named Peter Weersba and there is actually, 
this is an option. You can study abroad and get credits during winter break uh, at a lot of schools. So he studied abroad. Literally, their trip was for 12 days to Poland in the winter. And <laughs> it was just crazy. And he's like, yeah, man, like I, exactly what I was talking about. Like I knew I wanted to do it, but I needed somewhere cheap. And this is what they did. So he basically paid for the plane ticket and, and that was it. And 12 days, three credits, and he had the, the time of his life. So there are sh- – that you can go for short or as long as you want. Um, I've had two people on the show who er, – well, I've had some people that have gone multiple times, but two students that come to mind that have studied abroad for academic years. So two semesters, and like you can come home for winter break. So it's like going out of state, I guess, a real mm-hmm. long out of state, and, and they come home during winter break, and then they go back. Um, I just, I haven't posted this one, but I just talked to a guy, uh, who did two years in Australia and he's and it's because he fell in love with rugby and he just had mm-hmm. the time of his life. He had his rugby buddies down there. So he spent two years in Australia and he's actually going to Chile again. So he's back and there are, you'll run into students like that who are like at their home school in the U S or wherever their home school is, they'll end up like spending an actual year or two maybe on campus and studying abroad uh, every other time. Um, so the set, so that, that's the length the options. All, there are so many different options and I'll just do the main ones. Okay. There's, there's like, so that there's third party programs, which mm-hmm. are programs that you, they set everything up for you. You tell them where you want to go, what you want to do. A lot, in a lot of the instances, they'll set up an internship, which is a whole other area that we haven't even touched on, but they'll set up an internship for you, your school, your housing, take care of everything. There's mm-hmm. exchanges. And what, it is, what an exchange is, is it's where you pay the tuition at, as if you're going to your school and you're going mm-hmm. to a different school. So they, they, they'll set up a homestay a lot of the times. And but that's what an exchange is, and it's partnerships that your school has with different schools throughout the world. Um, you and then there's also I've taught I've done students that just interned abroad, and mm-hmm. you, in in most of these in a lot of these cases you've got to have the prerequisites out of the way, but you get you get credit for the internship, so it's like full time job in whatever field you want, and and you're getting credits that way. And then something that I haven't had on the show, but I'm looking for is you can also volunteer abroad, and that's something that a lot of students do. And it's, I, I don't know if you know anything about it, but it's harder to volunteer than you think. You can't just mm-hmm. show it. Like I, I still talk to my friends. It's like, you have to pay to volunteer in a lot of cases. And some of the cases you don't, and it's just crazy. Yeah. But again, it's the same way, like the third party programs, they set everything up for you. They make sure you're doing it right and you're safe. So there's that option. Um, so those are the four ones that come to mind. But again, there are people like me and there's different, there's different, options available for everyone do, do you have a sense chris of, of just of the four you mentioned sort of um which ones are 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 the most prevalent or or, or common mm-hmm. exchanges are probably the most common mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because as as far as the cost goes it's like in mm-hmm. my, like factor as a student it's factoring into my budget well it's just another semester of tuition mm-hmm. and a lot of times it boils down to the flight I don't, mm-hmm. a lot of people sugarcoat it and you'll see people post blogs like travel hackers, how to do this for, you know, travel the world on $50 or whatever. And you can, but you do spend more when you travel too. So that's something I want to keep in mind. I want mm-hmm. people to keep in mind is that mm-hmm. you're going to want to, if you're going to Buenos Aires, like I did, you're going to want to go to different countries and travel around and see different cities within that country. So you are spending a little more, but like we said, it, it's worth it. I, I quote people like when they put, when they do an interview, I put, I quote people like from some kind of um, good sense they had in years. I haven't posted it yet, but you say that you'll remember this when you're 80. Yes. And, oh, I did say yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So Kara so. said an exchange, you know, it was an exchange program. She got, you know, credit for it and she just took courses at the university there. But I did mention joy is uh, looking at going to Czechoslovakia uh, partly tied into the psychology program and, and some offerings they have there. I know um, at Davidson, there was an option to go in Davidson-based programs where a Davidson professor actually went on the trip is yep. what she did. That's I do have students on the show that have done that, like a faculty-led programming yes, thing. Yes, that's what she did. Just like, 
yeah, you're in a new location for like like every two days and you're just going around and you've got this like professor who loves, like he's just so excited for it, like a history professor or something. And he's doing it the whole year and this is what they do. Yeah, this guy, uh, this guy that she went with, like he knew the ambassadors at these different countries. He's incredible, yeah. incredibly connected. Yeah. And and a lot of times too, that like student, I've I'm working on an interview at, for a woman at University of Wisconsin Milwaukee. But you can also tie in, and, and this is what the this is what the smart study abroad students do. And that's why I'm hoping I seriously didn't mean that. But study abroad smarter. But you can tie in your major with where you're going. So for example, if you're an engineering major, you go to Germany. If you you want to do fashion, you go to France or Italy. Same thing with cooking. Uh, broadcaster media go to London, um, oce- oceanographer go to Australia, etc. Languages, China, sky's the limit. So there's, yeah. You know, it can also be a, a good opportunity to network with um, kids from other colleges because I know uh, Karis had a, I remember when we were going over all these options and she, they also, uh, Davison also has a partnership with Duke where they go on some the sort of Duke-based programs and and so she had a chance to do that, and she would have met a lot of the Duke students. And, um, you know, so there's sort of these coalitions out there where different – maybe your school doesn't offer one, but another school that you're affiliated with uh, has a program. You kind of can piggyback off of that. Is that. Do you see that a lot? Because I know that was an alternative that she had. Yeah. there. So – I, one of the questions that I ask in every interview is tell me about your living situation and the day-to-day life and the classes. Like, so it's, it's a, it goes into thirds. It's like, sometimes it's just students from your school. Other times it's just American students and other times it's all international students. Mm-hmm. And so it depends on where you go and what you're doing. But just speaking to the, we haven't even gotten into the, the fun part, I guess of it is the memories and the experiences but every student I talk to, there's like it's you make these friends for life, and it's the equivalence of again like rushing a fraternity or sorority or serving in the military. Like you have the or being on a sports team, mm-hmm. like you're going through this experience with these people, and it's like only you were there at that time, mm-hmm. and you're always going to have that. Mm-hmm. And now with with social media and everything, like everyone's keeping in touch. You've got these these friends and it gives you i mean they're already visiting like mm-hmm. even as their undergrads one girl this is crazy but she's like yeah my christmas present this year is i'm going back to australia mm-hmm. so she was at, she studied abroad in australia and she went back during like thanksgiving break to see all her friends so i have to tell you so you know i, t- I mentioned karis went to Honduras four times and and to kenya twice then after her freshman year of college she goes back to honduras again for five weeks and then just yesterday, she says, oh, we're having a reunion of all the people going to Honduras. She wants to go back again for her sixth time, you know, so so that that speaks to, uh, you know, it speaks to your point right there. Exactly. Yeah. So it's just it's just a whole nother social circle to get involved with. And as far as living living arrangement. So I know, um, you know, Karis, she stayed like with uh, with a family, so, you know, but sometimes. Uh, you see students actually staying in university dorms. Have you interviewed students that, that have, have had that experience? Yeah. Uh, so everywhere is different. I I'll speak from my experience mm-hmm. and you, you can, st- you, there are dorms. There are, sometimes there aren't. I was fortunate enough to have experienced both, uh, mm-hmm. homestay, which mm-hmm. if you, if you guys aren't listening and you're not familiar with study abroad at all, homestay is where you actually stay with a host family Mm -hmm. and you live in their house. So it's a great, it's a great way to learn languages. It's a great way to get acclimated to the culture. Um, Food is a big part of the podcast too. So Mm -hmm. like not only what they eat, but when do they eat it and how long are they eating it for, et cetera. And it's different all around the world. So there's a homestay and then you're also, it's, there's, I stayed in an apartment as well with roommates. And, you know, it's college and you're studying abroad. So it was just awesome. Got to meet these new people who I'm still in touch with today. Uh, one was from New Jersey and one was from France. And I'm forgetting where in France, but it's the south of France. And uh, so so I got to do two. And as far as the options go, it's just like anywhere else in the world. Like you can spend as much or as little as you want. So you can like get a bigger apartment or a bigger bedroom and or you can get the smallest thing possible and just save and spend all your money on excursions and things like that. So 
like for example i talked to a girl who they go yeah like we only eat this this and this during the week and we don't do anything and then on the weekends we go crazy and we'll take a train or a flight to so wherever they are i think she she was studying abroad in italy so yeah it's amazing how much the food is part of the cultural experience you know they get really getting to learn the the food that's in sort of endemic uh to that that part of the world um which is fascinating Next week in the news, America's colleges struggle to envision the future of diversity on campus. And we'll be in chapter 67 of 171 Answers. And it's how important is it to show academic passion and how to do it? And next week's question asks about international admissions, as in a U.S. student applying to a school abroad. And Mark wraps up his interview with Mr. Chris Carlton in the final part of the value of studying abroad. So, Nika, how are you doing over there in North Carolina? Because I kind of sense you itching to get back to the ATL a little bit. Do you? Oh, yeah. oh man, it's bad. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think our listeners know it, too. It's not just me. <laughs> Whoopsie. Well, You're a big yeah, city girl. Like You're a big city girl. Yeah, yeah, I am. I am. And I'm not going to deny. I'm coming back. <laughs> yes. Hey, I yay. <laughs> yay. I'm not, I don't know when yet, but I'm definitely going back. Yes. No shade, NC, but I'm just saying. That's my home. Love it. It's because you can't have everybody. My daughter lives in Charlotte now. Oh, that's right. By the way, Joy went to Athens this week, and she is now a big UGA fan. Like, she's got the sweatshirt. She's oh. got all that. She's all in. <laughs> she's <laughs> nauseating. Well. Especially when they're better than us in football. <laughs> but not basketball. <laughs> All right. Have a good week, Anika. You too. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. And if you found this podcast helpful, it would help us tremendously if you would subscribe and write us a review on your favorite podcast listening station. And please be sure to click the share button and send this to someone you know that could really use this information. Your College Bound Kid is produced by John Lockenball. The amazing music that you hear is by Victor Allen Weeks. Artwork is by Andrea Togo. And marketing designs are by Kimberly Blass. If you want to get a copy of the book, 171 Answers to the Most Asked College Admissions Questions, you can go right to 171answers.com. And if you want to have a college coaching session with Mark, you can send him a text to area code 404-664-464. Four, three, four, zero. And if you have a question or a few questions that you would like for us to answer on the show, please email us at questions at your collegeboundkid.com. That's questions with an S at your collegeboundkid.com. Every week, we'll take one question and include it in the episode. We don't like your questions. We love your questions. So send them our way. And by the way, check out our website, which is just simply your collegeboundkid.com. Again, we thank you for tuning in, and we look forward to meeting with you again next week.